Hello, hello, hello. I am very honored and privileged to be here today with all of you. My name is Salima Hamani, and I am proud to say that I've been an educator for the past 27 years. During my very first year of teaching, maybe, there we go. During my very first year of teaching, 26 years ago, I taught in a middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade in Pinellas Park. One of my very first expectations was that my students would rise and we would recite the Pledge of Allegiance. We would be very respectful. And to be honest, never had any issues. The pledge would come on, middle school, over the intercom, way back when, and we would recite the pledge. And then we would move on towards the rest of our day. And then one day, my assistant principal asked me to come to her office. And I did. And she told me, that I could not expect my students to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I was surprised. I said, why? She said, education is a right, not a privilege. I was shocked. What do you mean? Education is a privilege to me. It always has been, and it will always be. Why, you may ask? Well, let me tell you the story of how my parents ended up in this beautiful country. I was born in Kenya, but I lived in Uganda for many, many years prior to this. During this time, between the years of 1971 and 1979, a man by the name of Idi Amin ruled Uganda. He was considered to be one of the most brutal dictators that ever lived. He believed that he was selected by God to walk alongside kings, prime ministers, and presidents. Idi Amin was born in a small village called Kokobo in Uganda. He was raised by a single mother along with three other siblings. He was formally uneducated. His qualities, he was described as being charming, had a great personality, very charismatic, but he was also manipulative and very, very cunning. But it's these qualities that helped him rise through the military with great success. In 1962, Uganda gained its independence from Great Britain, and Prime Minister Aubau became the new Prime Minister. Prime Minister Aubau and Amin grew very close very quickly, and Amin soon became his right-hand man. Time went on, and the two started having disagreements, mostly about their illegal, yet very lucrative, smuggling business. And then on January 25th, 1971, Amin devised a military upstage, a very brutal, military upstage, and became the first new self-proclaimed president of Uganda. Initially, the people of Uganda were very happy because Prime Minister Aubau did not really care about the people of Uganda. And with Amin as the new president and Aubau in exile, Amin was free to govern with the military government. Amin consolidated his power with extreme brutality, terrorizing certain ethnic groups. In his first year, Amin killed 6,000, 6,000 of his own troops, simply if he felt like they had a clash of ideas. And during this time, between 80,000 and 300,000 people were murdered. But this is a rough estimate, because nobody really knows the correct numbers. Because at this point, everything was under Amin's power. But one thing that we do know for sure is, thousands and thousands of people suffered during this time, and also for many years after. And then in September of 1972, Amin declared in a speech that he was giving Uganda back 
to the ethnic Ugandans. Who was he referring to? He was referring to the Asian Africans. What did he want? He wanted them to leave Uganda. When? Immediately. What does this mean? This basically meant that if he were not black, you had to leave. The people of Uganda, the Asian Africans, did not understand this. They were so surprised. They were shocked. Many of them were born in Uganda. They were raised in Uganda. They were productive citizens of Uganda. And yet, they had to leave. Many were teachers. They were doctors. They were lawyers. They were successful business men and women. Some got scared, and some left immediately as they feared for their life and their families' lives. And with no elections, it was easy for Amin to implement a strict curfew system and also a uniform secret police system, which Amin directed to exercise the absolute power of life, liberty, and death. There is no definitive reason why Amin did this. Some say that he had a dream and he, com and he acted on this dream the very next day. Others say that Amin said God told him to do this. And yet others say that Amin fell in love with an Asian African, but because her family did not like Amin, they sent her away. My father was one of those people that eventually fled. At the time, our family consisted of my grandmother, Santok, my mother, Layla, and my two older sisters, Shmira and Namira. My dad was born in Uganda. He was a successful businessman in Uganda. He owned a grocery store. He did not believe that Amin's decisions affected him, because after all, he was born in Uganda. He was an ethnic Ugandan. He was a citizen. He was a productive member of society. Time went on, and tensions got worse. So at this time, my parents decided that my mother should take the three of us, my two sisters and I, to Kenya, to where her mother lived, just until the tensions died down. Because you see, at this time, many of the Asian African women were being raped by the military. Tensions continued to rise in Uganda. But my father, a self-made business owner, refused to leave. He was actually very, very stubborn. And then one day, one very fateful day, everything changed. He was on his way home, from his business. He had just finished the grocery store. And it was around curfew time. He was walking home, and all of a sudden, a soldier stopped him and pointed a rifle at his head. Now, at this time, soldiers were told not to ask questions. But by some miracle, the soldier turned my father around and said to him, Amir, what are you doing here? The soldier happened to be a customer of my father's. My father quickly explained that he was on his way home. And the soldier said, hurry up and get home and be safe. My father went home and realized that he had two choices. He could hold on to his property or he could keep his life. My dad chose his life. Immediately after this ordeal, the very first phone call that he made was to my mother. And he told my mother to stay in Nairobi, not knowing how long it would be until he saw his family. The second phone call that he made was to the United Nations. Now, the United Nations, along with Prince Aga Khan and the Aga Khan Developmental Network, were helping, were helping the Asian American Africans to leave Uganda and to find safety. And then in November of 1972, 
my grandmother and my father got on the last plane to a refugee camp in Malta. My father had to lie to his mother because she was just as stubborn as he was. And she was not about to leave her country, her home. They left with the clothes on their back. They left with the small suitcase of possessions. And at the age of 42, my father left his business, his home, his country, his extended family, and his friends. Why? Because he was not black. We were separated for one and a half years. My dad said that life in the refugee camp was very hard. The lines for food were very long. And the food was often too cold for his mother to eat. He was not able to obtain a work permit and felt defeated. My dad said, the refugee's life is the worst kind. You have to beg. Sometimes you have no choice but to accept charity. But he was always grateful to the Maltese people. He said, I'll never forget the Maltese people. They are not very rich, but they have a big heart. Meanwhile, in Kenya, my mom took my sisters and I to live with her mom, along with the, their siblings and their respective families. My mother eventually got a job in a fish market while her sister-in-law watched her three children. So my mom went from owning a grocery store to working in a fish market. My father tried to send money in food containers, hidden in food containers. Sometimes it got there, and sometimes it didn't. My mother and my sisters missed my father very much, and they would send letters, never knowing if they would actually get the letters. Now keep in mind that we had no cell phones, no computer, no internet, and definitely no WhatsApp. Now I was very young when this happened. I didn't even know who my father was. I believed that my father was my uncle, the man that was currently taking care of me at that time. And I began calling him daddy. Then in June of 1973, my dad got word that he was being sponsored by the King of Glory Lutheran Church and Pastor Rabine in Newport Ritchie, Florida, purely as a humanitarian gesture to come to the United States of America. And then, in February of 1974, our family was reunited in Newport Ritchie, Florida. Life was hard in the United States for them new language, new customs, new ways of work, new everything. My father quickly got a job as a stock boy in the grocery store, and then went on to work at Dunkin' Donuts. He went from owning a grocery store to working as a stock boy in a grocery store. My mother got a job at Square D Company, working with large transformers. She did not have a driver's license at this time, so she would walk to school. I'm sorry, walk to work, a couple of miles each way. She worked from 4 a.m. to 4 p.m., six days a week. She went from owning a grocery store to working at Square D Company, working with large transformers. Life was very different for my sisters as well. New school, new language. They'd left all their friends at home, their home, their extended family. It was different for everyone except for me. The only thing that I had left behind was the man that I thought was my father, my uncle. My parents' lives had changed drastically. My mother remembered a conversation that my father had with Pastor Rabine. Now, Pastor Rabine was the man that sponsored us. 
and they were looking at the worthless documents of the property and the store that we had owned, which was worth about $140,000 at the time, which today would be about $938,000. And my father said, it is useless to keep in mind everything that we have lost. Our future never looked brighter than it is now. The pastor, being a for former refugee himself, told my parents, it is difficult to lose your possessions, your home, and your country. The streets of America are not paved with gold, but nowhere else will you get such great opportunities. As my sisters got older, our parents always told us, we owe so much to the pasture. And my father would say, the best man in the whole wide world. My dad passed in 2012. But before he did, he always told his grandchildren that he was never angry with Amin. In fact, he was grateful to Amin because if it were not for Idi Amin, if it were not for the Lutheran Church, if it not were for Pastor Rabine, our family would never have seen this America. Despite all the hardships my parents faced, they always viewed coming to America as a land of opportunity for their children as well as their grandchildren. Our family proudly became citizens in September of 1980. I truly believe that I understand what it means to be able to live in this country due to my family's migration from Uganda. I will never take this country for granted for many reasons. One is that it has given us an education. One that should never be taken for granted. Looking back as an adult, I realize that so much of the values that I was raised on, I have instilled into my own children. I believe that they know the value of education, and I hope that they take advantage of every opportunity that comes across to them. So back to the beginning of my story. Although I do not teach anymore, I am now a behavior specialist at San Jose Elementary. Go Hawks! Every day when that Pledge of Allegiance comes on, I stand proudly and I recite the pledge and I highly encourage others to do the same. When, I became, when my parents became citizens, I was nine years old. And I remember very, very vividly going to the citizenship ceremony. And I remember standing next to my parents and I remember standing and watching them as they recited the pledge. I remember the smiles on their faces. And then a song came on, God Bless the USA. And I remember looking up at them, and I remember the, the tears in their eyes. I have that very, very vivid memory of this. I was blessed. I was blessed to be able to go to the citizenship ceremony again with my husband. Now, he wasn't my husband at the time, but this time I was an adult going to the citizenship ceremony. And I remember standing and reciting the pledge with him. And I looked over at him, and he also had a huge smile on his face. And then the same song came on. God bless the USA. And this time, I'm the one that had tears in my eyes. Coming to the United States has been such a privilege to me. I am so very blessed because I know that if I had stayed in Uganda, I would not have had the educational opportunities that I have had. So while some people feel that education is a right, others, including myself, believe that it is a true privilege. 
thank you for allowing me to share my story with you, and God bless the USA.